Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to look at omnidirectional wheels, the wheels that do not have the constraint of non-holonomic motion, which we saw in differential drive robots, right? If you remember, differential drive robots cannot drive sideways. All they can do is to go forward, backward, and then basically steer left and right, but they cannot immediately move left uh, to the sideways, to their left or to the right. That's why in robotics we have another category of uh, mobile robots called uh, the robots with omnidirectional wheels. And when we talk about them, there are two categories. There is one category specifically that you see on the left, we call them omnidirectional and there is another category of them that we give him a separate name, although they are also omnidirectional, but uh, these guys, we call them the mechanum wheels. And the major difference between them is the angle of these uh, rollers that you see on the circumference of the wheel with respect to the wheel axis, okay? So if you look at them from the top, these are the wheels, these three guys, these three uh, rectangles, and these uh, kind of um, donut shapes that you see. These are those sliders which allow the free sliding to the side. And in omnidirectional wheels, if you see, the axis of rotation for the wheel is aligned with these sliding elements. While for the mechanum ones, the axis of rotation of the wheel, which is perpendicular to the wheel like this, this axis is what? Is at an angle, which typically is like 45 degree angle with respect to the um, uh, sliding elements with respect to the rollers, okay? So here, this angle is zero between the normal and the direction of uh, these uh, rollings, right? And here it is 45 degrees. So that's the major difference, but these sliders on the circumference of the wheels, they will allow a sideway motion immediately and make it omnidirectional. So we are going to look at the kinematics of these robots, how they move, and uh, we try to relate the uh, joint velocities or the RPM of the wheels to the workspace velocities of these robots, namely x dot, y dot, and then the time derivative of the angle of the chassis here, we call it phi, so phi dot. Okay, so uh, here we use three coordinate frames to derive our equations of uh, motion, we have frame S, space frame or inertial frame or stationary frame, however you want to interpret that. This is our inertial frame that does not move. We have a frame B with origin at the center of the uh, total robot and with uh, frames uh, with uh, axes X, Y, and Z all attached to the rigid body, so we call it body attached frame. The angle of x of b with respect to x of s is phi, so the only rotation that you can have here for the chassis with respect to the inertial frame is a rotation z with angle phi. And we have a third frame, frame w, where x of w is basically um, perpendicular to the axis of the wheel y of w is the axis of the rotation of the wheel x of w is in the x y plane perpendicular to that such that z of w is in the same direction as z of b and z of s all of them out of the plane toward us okay so this x w y w z w is called the wheel attached frame it does move with the wheel and the location of the origin of that we show with xi and yi because we have several wheels here, right? So each one has its own origin. So basically for each one of the wheels, you have to have one of these frames, xw, yw, and zw. 
So the parameters involved in the kinematics, as you can see, is phi to go from frame uh, S to frame B by rotation. And then when you want to go from frame B to frame uh, W, you need to know the location of the center, Xi and Yi. You need to know angle gamma I, which we described earlier. That's the direction of the free sliding with respect to Y of W, right, in a counterclockwise manner. And here we also have a direction beta I. What is that? Beta I is the angle that shows the direction of motion for each wheel. So if you look, it is the angle between XW, which is the angle that shows the direction of the wheel, and X of B. So this line here that you see, that is the same as X of B, this line here. That is parallel to X of B. And X of B is the direction of motion, right? If you remember when we had the differential drive robots, correct? X was the direction of motion of the whole robot, X of the body attached frame. So that's the same thing here. This X of B showing the direction of motion for the robot. So the angle of the wheel with respect to that direction of motion for each wheel is called beta I. So beta I, X I, and Y I, they are all expressed for each wheel in the body attached frame. Okay, those are to describe frame W really with respect to frame B, correct? A rotation beta and then the center at X I and Y I and frame B is described in frame S by really the rotation phi. Okay, so now with all that, how do we get our uh, kinematics, uh, differential kinematics equations, forward kinematics equations? So what we need is this. If we look at each wheel here with arbitrary angle gamma, where the angle gamma, as I said, shows the direction of free sliding with respect to the driving direction, right? Because when this wheel rotates about this axis YW, correct? Uh, the wheel wants to move forward or backward, correct? This is the top view. So if you see it from the side view, this is your X of W, right? The direction of motion. And Y of W is out of the plane toward us or in the plane. doesn't matter. It's just the rotation about Y of W that makes the rotation, ha the uh, linear motion happen. And you have also the direction of free sliding, right? So you have these two directions, driving direction and free sliding direction. Fine. So now what do we do? What we do is we say if we have the velocity of the robot with respect to frame W, written in frame W. So here when we say Vx and Vy, we mean the velocity of the robot written in frame W, correct? So Vx is the velocity of the robot in frame W, so it is going to be aligned XW, and Vy is the velocity component of the robot aligned YW, so it is Vy, okay? So these are Vx and Vy, good. Now, I will decompose this Vx and Vy along the what? Along the driving direction and along the free sliding direction. Y, we'll see. So, if I want to find the total component along the driving direction, definitely your Vx is entirely along the driving direction. That's why you see it here. Vy, you need to decompose that along this driving direction. How? Well, if you look here, this angle between YW and the free sliding is gamma, right? So if I uh, project that, right, along this, let me redo it. So here, if I project that normally like this, and this angle is gamma, and as I said, this whole thing is VY, then this component here that you will get one of it aligned the free direction, correct? The sliding, uh, free sliding direction is what? 
Well, is that going to be Vy cosine gamma? Or here, as it says, Vy divided by cosine gamma. Well, what we need is to project this along what? Along the xw and along the um, free sliding direction, okay? And the problem that we have here is this axis. And this axis are not perpendicular to each other. So that's not how you decompose, right? If I show you a piece of, uh, a piece of white uh, paper. So these are the axes that you have. And this is the vector that you have. So when you want to decompose, you are not going to use perpendiculars. Why? Because your axis along which you are trying to uh, decompose, this was the driving direction. This was the sliding direction. And this is V of Y, and this angle is gamma. When you try to decompose along axes that are not perpendicular to each other, you have to go parallel to them. So here, you have to go parallel to the driving and here you have to go what? Parallel to the sliding. So one component is this one, the other component is this one. Okay, so we have to be careful how we are decomposing. And now the question is, what is this guy? Well, here it's a right triangle, as you can see. If this is Vy, this guy, the hypotenuse, is going to be Vy divided by cosine of gamma. Okay, and what about this one? What is this? So here, this is gamma, right? And if I get this one, that's the same as this guy. And what is that? So this is Vy. Tangent of gamma is that number um, divided by Vy. So that number is going to be Vy times tangent of gamma. Okay, so the sliding component is Vy over cosine gamma or Vy times sec second of gamma. And the other one is Vy times tangent gamma. So when you see them here, these terms, one of them is Vy tangent gamma. The other one is Vy over cosine gamma. You see what I mean. And Vx here, as we said, is completely along the driving direction. So we add it here. Good. So with all that in mind, Let's summarize what we did. So if I have my Vx and Vy, which are the velocity components of the robot written in frame W in the wheel frame, right? If I want to, based on those, find my components along the driving direction and along the sliding direction, the sliding direction is Vy cosine gamma, the driving direction is Vx plus Vy what tangent gamma good fine now how can i use these two pieces of information well we know that the drive component is going to be what the center of the wheel linear velocity correct so as i said if you look at this wheel from the front view this is your wheel and that component v drive is the velocity at the centroid and how can I find this? Well, if I know the radius of the wheel R, and if I know how the wheel is what? Rotating, correct? If I know the omega of the wheel, here that omega I show with U instead of omega. So if omega of the wheel here, I call it U, then because U is your input, the reason it's shown with U is because in control systems, we typically show the input to the system as U, and since the control signal here for this robot is the RPM of the tires, that's why we call it U, so don't be surprised if Omega is called U. So this V drive, V of the centroid, is clearly what? R times U if there is no sliding, it's rolling without slipping, right? And that's what you see here, that from here, clearly, U is V drive over R, and V drive was Vx plus Vy tangent gamma over R. So this is the formula that you get. This is how fast you need to rotate each wheel if you want to achieve Vx and Vy, correct? When you have angle gamma and when the radius of the tire is R. Now, the thing is this. This Vx and Vy, as we said, these are the velocity of the robot 
but not in the special frame, they are in the W frame. What do we call the velocity of the robot in the special frame? We call them X dot and Y dot. So this X dot and Y dot are not the same as VX and VY. They are the same entity, but they are written along different frames. These guys are written in frame S. These two guys are written in frame W. But since they refer to the same thing, I should be able to, using homogeneous transformations, rotations, translation, and so on, I should be able to write these W components back into the what? S components or write S components into W components, right? So I know how to go from one frame to another. That's not a big thing. Once I get this equation, I should be able to do the rest. Good? And another thing I can do is not only I can go directly from W to S and vice versa, I can also go to frame B if I want. Many times it's convenient that we write everything in frame B. And I should be able to do that as well, right? I know how to go from any frame to any other frame. So I have all these relations. I can do all the transformations, right? So here, what I will do, I will rewrite this equation start that we have here. I will write it one time in frame B because it's written in frame W. And one time I'm going to write it in frame S so that I can have U based on the components in frame B and in frame S, and those will give us the final differential forward kinematics equations that we need, right? Okay, let's achieve those. So if I want to go from frame W to S or from frame S to W, how can I do that? Well, I know that I can write this uh, equation star as what? I can write it as U is equal to VX, correct? right vx over r plus what vy over r times tangent of gamma right this is what i have agreed now as i said all i need is to write this vx and vy pair in terms of what in terms of their components another way i can write this if i want to write it in a matrix format is I write it like this. I say it's a uh, 1 by 2 times a 2 by 1. Well, the components of this 1 by 2 are 1 over R and 1 over R times tangent of gamma. Correct? I can write it that way as well. And that's exactly what you can see here. This is 1 over R, and 1 over R tangent of gamma, that's U. So whatever is the rest, whatever is the rest that you can see here, all of this should be simply what? Should be simply Vx and Vy, which are written in frame W, correct? So now... Why do I need all of these terms to get to Vx and Vy in frame W? Well, let's find out why. So, the first term I have here, the first term that you see I have here, this guy, is what? This one is the velocity of the um, robot written in frame S, correct? Well, I also added to them the angular velocity as well, phi dot. Remember, phi was the angle of uh, attached frame by the attached frame with respect to special. So the time derivative of that is omega of the chassis with respect to the inertial frame. So here, not only I add x dot and y dot, where x and y here are this x and y, not only I have that, which determines the velocity of the centroid of the robot, I also add the angular velocity of the chassis. And this is like the pose that we have for the robot. Remember, this guy, we call it the pose. This is like the time derivative of the pose, okay, which is the velocity of the robot in the S-frame. 
Now, how do I go from S frame to B frame? So when I want to go from S to W, I don't go in one step. Typically, I go first from S to B and then go from B to W. Okay, so let me get rid of these. The path that I'm taking is this one. I go from S to B and then I go from B to W so that I can go from S to W. So the first part that you see I'm doing here and uh, if you don't mind, let me do a little bit of cleaning because now it is getting out of control. So let me do a little bit of cleaning because you cannot even see what I'm doing. So as I said, this is the velocity in frame S. Now I multiplied by this matrix to take it to frame B. So this is the first step. And what am I doing here? I'm multiplying basically this sub matrix, this sub matrix two by two by x dot and y dot to give me x dot and y dot in frame B and the rest of it is used to just handle phi dot. So really this matrix that you see here, which looks like an X rotation, it is not an X rotation. For two reasons. First of all, uh, when you want to go from frame S to frame B, the rotation is going to happen about the Z axis, not about the X axis. One. Two, an X rotation frame, depending on you go from what frame to frame, from old frame to the new frame or new frame to the old frame, might look a little bit different. So this is like an X rotation when you go from old frame to the new frame and not backwards. So it can be considered a rotation X, but really, as I said here, we do a Z rotation. So there is no justification that this is an X rotation. What it really is, is a bigger matrix that has a Z rotation in it. If you look at this guy, this is a Z rotation, right? But here you're going from uh, old frame to new frame. So this is your old frame. This is your new frame. If you remember, any vector in the old frame is written as what? A rotation matrix. In this case, it's rotation of Z and angle phi times what? P of the new, correct? This is what we had earlier in robotics. You want to go from new frame to old frame, use this rotation matrix Z, which is of new frame with respect to old frame, and this rotation Z, which you can write it like this, new with respect to old, if you remember, and if you do it in 2D, because here everything we do, the rotations are 2D, if you remember, it was like what? If the angle was phi, it was cosine of phi, negative sine of phi, sine of phi, and cosine of phi right? So this is what we had earlier. Now if you compare that matrix to this one, you see the sine component, the negative component is exchanged, right? So instead of sine component negative B in position 1, 2, it is in 2, 1, and the positive is instead of being in 1, 2, it is in 2, 1 for this one. So they are exchanged. What does that mean? It means that guy is the transpose of this one, and it should be. Why? Because S is the old B is the new. So this one is taking us from old frame. This is a V in the old frame. When you multiply by this, that gives us the new frame. So what we're really doing here is the opposite of this one. We are really doing what? We are really taking a velocity in the old frame and we convert it into a velocity into what? The new frame. New means B, old means S, as I said. And for that, I need to do a inverse. Or we know since inverse is the same as what? Is the same as a transpose. If I want this one, correct? I have to either use inverse or I can use what? The transpose if I want to. So it is going to be the transpose of this guy. And that will give you this one. Okay, so don't be confused that the negatives are exchanged. There is a reason because we are going from old frame to new frame. Good. So this is completely clear. Now, what's the rest of these ones and zeros? Well, all you do here is by multiplying this whole thing. 
by that column vector that only gives you phi dot, right? And these two extra zeros, when they are multiplied by x dot and y dot, give you nothing, right? They just give you zero. So in other words, if I want to just multiply this together so you see what it gives you, what is it? If I simplify this and show the result to you, what's the result of that, right? So let me show you that. It's just adding an extra component, phi dot, which makes us go from a 2 by 2 to a 3 by 3. When I multiply, the result of that is going to be phi dot, and then uh, cosine of phi times x dot plus sine of phi times y dot, negative sine of phi x dot, and plus cosine of phi times y dot where these two are clearly taking my velocity from x uh, from s frame to the b frame and this one says phi dot in the s frame is the same as phi dot in the b frame and of course they are right this phi dot in the um, s frame is aligned z and in the b frame is aligned z and the z of b and z of s are the same thing so this angular road uh, velocity phi dot it doesn't matter whether you write it in S or B, it's always going to be 0, 0, 1, right? Times phi dot. So you clearly see what this first uh, multiplication means. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Now, what's the next component that we are multiplying here? The next component, now that I could uh, rotate the velocity in this frame, this x dot and y dot, now that I could rotate these guys and take them to the frame B, now it is time to go from frame B to frame W. And what you need here, since each wheel has a separate origin, it is important that not only you rotate these components that you have here that are now in frame B, it's important that not only you uh, uh, decompose them along x, w, and y, w, also it's important to put those components at what? At the center of each wheel, right? Because here you have different wheels. Each wheel has its own center. And uh, for that reason also, the relation, the direction of XWs and YWs are also different as well, the, the orientation of them. So if you look, for example, in a general case like this, each wheel has its own center with respect to the centroid of the robot, and each wheel has its own beta, right? So if you look, this wheel has a beta 1 of 0, this one has negative 1 to any, this one has positive 1 to any, and the location of the centers for each one of the wheels with respect to the center of the robot is a separate thing, okay? So their XWs and YWs will be different. And for that reason, we try to first use this translation component to uh, bring this component into the center of each wheel and then here we apply the rotation to align them with XW and YW and what is this again you see this is a rotation Z with angle beta but again it's a transpose if you see the sign the, ne the negative sign is exchanged here and why again because we are going from an old frame to the new frame this time my old frame is frame B my new frame is frame W, and the angle is beta about z-axis, so that's, you see, that's RZ and beta transpose of it. So when you multiply all this together, this is your translation to the center of the wheel. Let me write it for you, if I want to describe each one of these components. right this one is going from frame s to frame b this one is 
translating to the will I center. This is rotating from frame B to frame W. And now the result of that whole thing is going to be X and Y, VX and VY in frame W. And if you remember, if I multiply them by this matrix, that gives me the rotation for that will, which is this last part here. Okay? So if I combine all these products, matrix products, I will get this simple result down here. That if I describe ui, the rotation velocity of will number i, as a function of the complete pose vector. So this q dot that you see here, this q dot is what? Is your phi dot, x dot, and y dot. Right? The pose velocity in the spatial frame. If I want to describe the rotational velocity of each wheel as a function of that, all I need is to multiply it by this matrix HI of phi. Right? HI of phi, where HI of phi is the product of all of these four big things. That whole thing is phi i. Which, if you want to write it, it's going to be 1 over i i cosine gamma i, and then it has three components, and it's transpose of that. So the dimension of this guy is really going to be a what? A 1 by 3. Right? And it should be, because here you have a 1 by 3, and q dot is a 3 by 1, so when you multiply, you will get a 1 by 1, a single number for rotation of that wheel. Good? Now, why do we call it uh, HI of phi? Because clearly you see angle phi is in it. So it is a function of phi. But why don't you call it a function of phi, beta, uh, beta gamma, xi, and yi? Because for each will, xi, yi, gamma i, and beta i, these are constant numbers. So for each will, each one of these uh, entities with uh, index i they are all constant number as i said if you look at these two special cases of the omnidirectional and the mechanum you see for each will you have a specific gamma a specific beta and i'll show you also the specific x and y's we're going to go look at the numbers okay but uh clearly the major thing that is changing in this is the angle phi. So as the robot keeps rotating the chassis of the robot, this H matrix for each one of the wheels does change. So it's not a constant thing, okay? It does depend on the current angle of the chassis. Now you might say, was it the same in differential drive robots? The answer is yes. If you go back and look at the governing equations for the differential drive robot, if you see here, this vector is your q dot and this vector these are the phi's these are the angular velocities of each tire so this is like u1 this is like u2 if i want to write u1 and u2 as a function of q dot i need this matrix in a transpose form of it right now of course here you have uh, three uh, equations and two unknowns so your system is um basically um over constrained really right because you have more equations than unknowns but remember that you cannot just choose any u1 and u2 that you desire right or if you want to put it uh, the other way you cannot choose any x dot and y dot that you desire really right you know the x dot and y dot of the robot they do depend on each other because i cannot move sideways so this x dot and y dot that I have in a differential drive robot, if I choose one of them, let's say x dot, correct? Y dot is not going to be what? Is not going to be arbitrary, correct? So you better go from this equation, actually, if you want to.
because here I have V and I have omega, right? I have V and I have omega. So here I have two equations and two unknowns and it's easier to find it. But if you really want to choose X dot Y dot and theta dot, you have to pay attention that the ratio of Y dot over X dot has to be what? Has to be tangent of theta. Okay, otherwise you mean that you will have um, the type of motion that causes a lateral slide and that's not possible for this robot. Okay, so you have to pay attention. It's not really three equations and two unknowns or if it is, you have to consider this uh, holonomic cons non holonomic constraint. You have three equations, two unknowns, but you have a constraint also to satisfy, so it means you really have two equations and two unknowns. Okay, but clearly, as you can see, this matrix that relates Q dot and U1 and U2 does depend on what? Does depend on U, on theta, I'm sorry. Theta is the same as phi for our case, right? So it's no surprise that it does depend on phi and makes these... Um, Matrices HI, depending on phi, they are not constant, they are variable. But here, if we go back and look at the other case, also it's interesting. What's the difference between 3 and 2 here? If I ask you what's the difference between 3 and 2, what would you tell me? Because both of them are relating the RPMs of the tires to something for us, right? What is that something? In this case, this guy here is the velocity of what? Of your robot written in the S-frame. Right? This is the velocity written in the S-frame. What about this case? What is this? This is the velocity, but this is in the B-frame. In the B-frame, if you remember, all you have is a V in the XR direction, Along YR, there is no motion, and along ZR, you have omega. So if you write your velocities along the X, uh, which for us here, this R is the same as B. So if you want, I can call it XB and YB. So if instead of me writing the velocity desired in the S frame, if I write it in the B frame, the good thing about it is... First of all, it gets rid of that constraint for me already. It incorporates that constraint by setting one of, because there is a third velocity component here, but that is what? That is zero, and I don't need to incorporate that. That's the velocity line y, 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 b. I don't need to incorporate that. That's already zero. I just need to add a couple of more zeros, which does not give me anything. So this equation already considered the constraint while this one does have an implicit non-holonomic constraint in it. The other good thing about it is if you look at this matrix that relates these guys together, this is a constant matrix. There is no variable in it while this one does have a variable in it, theta. So it's more convenient that when I write these equations, these differential drive equations, most of the time, it's easier to relate what? The RPM of the tires, the wheels, to the velocity in the B frame, not in the S frame. It makes life a lot easier by reducing the number of redundant equations or incorporating the constraints, as well as making my matrices constant matrices. That's the same thing happening here. If you look, these HI phi's are variable because phi is variable. And most of the time, uh, it's not really easy to determine all of the UIs. I'll show you. But uh, here, as I said, you can also write everything in the frame B. How? Let's find out. So if I want to write everything in frame B, what's the difference? This is in frame, uh, this is coming from frame S to frame W. What if I wanted to go from frame B to W only? Well, then you might say I have to skip this step because this is the only relation between S and B. If I take this uh, step out of the way, that's all I need. Or in other words, 
when I go from frame B to frame W, frame B already has in its angle phi. It does rotate with phi dots. So when you are in frame B, you will never feel phi dot, right? Phi dot is a part of you. You don't feel phi dot. It's frame S that sees phi dot, not frame B. So all you can say is, if I want to go from frame B to W, all I need to do is to set this phi to zero, right? Or do not consider it. There is no phi. All I can see is beta, xi, yi, and gamma i. And that's what you see here. So if you want to write u as the velocities in the B frame, what you need is all of these h1, h2, which are for each one of the frames, instead of at angle phi, you set them all to be at angle what? Zero, which is what you can see here. Okay? And what's the good thing about it? The good thing is now each one of these matrices is a constant matrix. There is no variable in it. That's the best thing that you can do. Good? So, uh, good. With all that, now how do I combine all of these equations? Because if you see, each equation here is only for one of the wheels, right? Each one is relating your desired velocity in whatever frame to what to the desire to the uh, required sorry to the required angular velocity of will i how much velocity do you need at will i so you can achieve that desired velocity right how much well here each one of these hi's is gives you one relation for one of the wheels but you can combine them you can concatenate them you can concatenate all of these individual equations into a matrix format. So here, this u vector is a vector of what? u1, u2, all the way to um, where m here is the number of wheels. Okay, m is the number of wheels. And all of those edges that you have, H1, H2, Hm of phi, you combine all of these guys into one single matrix, which you call it what? H of capital H of phi. And this vector Q dot here is the same as phi dot, X dot, and Y dot. So you can write the whole thing into this uh, vector format, matrix format, using matrix H phi. And what kind of equation is that? What do we call this equation? So here, I don't have will RPMs and get Q dot. I have Q dot. I need to know how much U I need. So what do we call these equations, if you know? Yes, you are right. We call them what? Differential. inverse or inverse velocity let me call it that way because that's what we used to call them these are the inverse velocity equations correct if i know my desired velocity in the worker space right this is velocity in the worker space how should I rotate each one of my tires to achieve that, right? These are the inverse velocity equations. Forward means I give you u, you give me phi dot, x dot, and y dot. Can you do that? Well, in this case, not that easy, right? <laughs> because I need to reverse that equation. And if I want to reverse that equation, it does depend on how many wheels I have. If I have three wheels, then this matrix H is going to be 3 by 3. Q is 3 by 1. And U has three wheels, so it's 3 by 1. So now if I want to get my forward velocity equations, I can say Q dot is now what? H inverse times u, correct? So if I want to get my forward velocity equations, I can invert h and get u. The problem is when you don't have three wheels, when you have more than three wheels, right? Because in most of the cases, 
your omnidirectional can have more than three wheels. Like if it's like this case, you're good. You have three wheels, three velocity components, you can easily invert. But in this case, M is four, you have four wheels. So this matrix here is gonna be what? Where were we? Here. In this case, it's U is gonna be four by one. And this guy is gonna be a four by three. And you cannot invert a four by three. And you might say, can I do the pseudo inverse? Well, you can, but what does that mean? Pseudo inverse. You know, pseudo inverse is the solution to what? To least square problems. And least square problems will never give you exact values. They give you the values with minimal error. So it means what? It means the U that you find can achieve Qs with some errors, not exactly. Right? And that's right. You, you, if you just choose arbitrary values for Q dot, you're not going to be able to achieve it with Us. There should be some constraint between the components of this Q dot so that you can freely choose Us. Okay? I'll show you in an example right now. So when you have more than three wheels, inverting that and going to forward velocity equations is a little bit tricky, but I'll show you. No worries. So, uh, good. And if you want to stick to U in, uh, sorry, V in frame B, so if you want, instead of this Q dot, this whole thing to be in frame S, you write it in frame B. So this Q dot was in frame S. If you write it in frame B, then here I call it VB. So this VB is the same as Q dot, but it is in frame B. You might call it a twist. Okay, that's what they call in robotics, they call it a twist. What is a twist? We'll have a separate video on it. But basically this twist here is a combination of angular velocity and linear velocities. So when you combine the angular and linear velocities of anything, right, you might call it what? A twist. So this guy here, is called the body twist. So this body twist can be multiplied by this H whole big matrix at all phi of zeros to get you used. That's another way to describe it. Good. Now, Let's talk about a couple of examples and make all these relations more clear and then I show you some demo. Okay, because you need to really touch this material with some examples and demos. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of formulas. So, let's take a look at a few cases. One, the omnidirectional wheel with three wheels. Right? Your frame S is out here. That's your inertial frame. Your body attached frame is at the centroid. And uh, this is the direction that you have for it at the moment. So the phi is at the moment zero, but it can change as this guy rotates. And uh, now, Attached to each wheel, there is a separate frame x, w, and y, w. So here is like x, w, 1. This is like y, w, 1. This is like x, w, 2. This is y, w, 2. This is like x, w, 3. This is like y, w, 3. So there are three separate frames for each one of the wheels. Now, what are the three, uh, what are the four values for each one of the wheels that you have to choose? X, I, Y, I, beta, I, and gamma, I. X, I, and Y, I are the location of the center of the wheel with respect to the body frame. So it's here, the center. And what's the location of the center in XB and YB? Well, in XB, there is nothing. In YB, you have this distance, correct? Which you called what? You called it D. 
So it should be 0 and D. And so if I want to write it somewhere for you, for this center, your xi and yi is equal to 0 and D. Good. Now we go to number 2. What's the center for this one? So here, xi and yi are what? Well, clearly you have this distance d, correct? But as you can see, you have some angle here, right? Because this whole angle here is 120. These are all symmetric with respect to the center. So this angle here is 60 degrees, or sorry, 30 degrees. Right? Because this is 90, that's 120, so that's 30. And that is D, so clearly your XD is going to be what? It is going to be D cosine 30, and your Y is going to be negative D sine 30, correct? And if you look at the third one here, or this one, your xi and yi are similar to frame 2, except x is negative of that. So it's going to be negative d cosine 30 and negative d sine 30. Okay, so these are the xi and yi for each one of these w frames. Now, what's beta? What's gamma? Beta, if you remember, is the angle between XW and XB, correct? The XW and XB, the angle between XW and B, if you go from B to W, that's the angle. So how much is it? Well, if you look at frame 1, the XW of the frame 1 is aligned with XB, so the angle beta 1 should be what? 0. What about frame 2? If you look at XW here and frame B, so this is your frame B, X of B, if you want to go from x of b to x of w2, your angle is negative 1 to any, which is you can see here. And the same thing here. This is your x of b. If you want to go from x of b to x of w3, the angle is positive 1 to any, right? Which you can see here. Okay, so you clearly see how betas are achieved. What about gamma? Gamma is the angle between what? Is the angle between YW and the sliders, right? If you look for each one of these, and we mentioned earlier that for this type of omnidirectional, the gammas are all what? Zero, right? Because as I said, gamma is the direction of Y for each frame, YW, and the direction of these sliders. So you see for all of these cases, that's what? That's zero. So it's no surprise here that you see all of these gammas are what? Zero. Good. So clearly here you see all of the values. X, Y, gamma, and beta for each one of the wheels. And if you plug all of them into this relation here, right? That will give you u1, u2, and u3, the u for each one of the wheels, as a function of what? Omega of the chassis, vx, and vy of the centroid, but written in frame b. So omega, bz, vbx, and vby are, as I said, the twist, the body twist. They are the angular velocity and linear velocity of the robot written in the, body, in the robot frame. And this h matrix 0... The first row of it is what? H1 of 0, correct? The next one is H2 of 0, and then H3 of 0, right? So here, this guy is H1 of 0, then you have H2 of 0, and then you have H3 of 0. And if you concatenate it, that's what you get is h of 0, which is this whole matrix, of course, times r. Now, did we get it from this relation? Sure. If you look at this relation, this is what you have for 
each one of them. So for example, what is H1? Let's calculate it. H1 at zero, correct? Because remember, these are all at zero. So you need to consider phi to be zero in these relations. What is H1? Just remember what we had for H1. We had X1, which was zero. We had Y1, which was D. We had gamma one, which was zero, and we had beta one, which was also zero, correct? These are the numbers that we had for the first will. So if we go ahead and plug them here, what would you get? You will get one divided by R1 cosine of zero, which is one. So it's R1 times what? X, X is zero, so this term is gonna go away minus y so it's going to be and beta and gamma are both zero so this cosine is going to be one so it's going to be negative d only this is going to be cosine of zero 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 so that's one sine of zero 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 so that's a zero transpose so it's going to be one over r if you assumed all the tires have the same radius negative d one and zero correct that's your first row now let's see if that's the case here and you see these, right? Then if you plug in the other ones, you will similarly get what? H2 and H3. Let's do that. Let's just practice on that. So for will number two, your X2 was D cosine of 30. Your Y number two was negative D sine of 30. Your beta... Uh, 2 was negative 1 to any and your gamma number 2 was also 0 correct so if we plug in what do we get into this general formula with phi of 0 of course so we'll get h2 of 0 to be 1 over r and then cosine of gamma, gamma was zero again, so cosine of gamma is one. So it's one over R2, but R2 is the same as R, because they are all assumed to be the same uh, radius. Now, what do we have? Uh, here, X and Y, none of them is zero. Beta plus gamma is going to be what? It's going to be uh, one to any negative. So this is negative one to any, and this is negative uh, one to any. Sine of 1 to any, as you know, is the same as sine of 60, and but this is negative, so it's going to be negative sine 60, and sine of 60 is the square root 3 over 2, so it's negative square root 3 over 2 times x. Now, x itself is d cosine 30, cosine 30 is also square root 3 over 2. So it's going to be d square root 3 over 2 times what? Negative square root 3 over 2. If you simplify, you're going to get negative 3 over 4d. Right? That's for the first term. The second term is going to be y times a similar thing. Now, cosine of negative 1 to any is the same as cosine of positive 1 to any is negative cosine 60, which is negative 1 half. Negative and negative cancels, so you get a one-half for this whole thing. And y is negative d sine 30, which is one-half, so it's negative one-half d times positive one-half. So it's negative d over 4. Then we go to next one, cosine of all angles added together. So if you add them, gamma is 0, phi is 0, so it's just going to be cosine of negative 1 to any, which as we said is uh, negative cosine 60, and that's negative 1 half. And then we have sine of it, which is square root 3 over 2, but with the negative sign, why? Because beta is negative. And sine of negative 120 is a negative number. Okay, so this is what you have. And these two, if you simplify, that's simply negative d, right? So negative d, negative 1 half, negative square root 3 over 2 times 1 over r2 or 1 over r. Is that what you get? You see it's 
right or not. So I have a negative D, I have a negative one half, and I have, did I have a negative one half here? Uh, yes, a negative square root three over two, which is the same as sine of pi over three, pi over three, 60 degrees. Sine of it is a square root three over two, and there is a negative sign. And if you do on the third one, you will get the same thing, right? So now, here, you clearly can see that if I have the body twist, I can get all of the three U's that I need through this matrix. So this is my inverse velocity problem. If I say I want to rotate at 5 radians per second and move 2 meters per second and 3 meters per second along VBX and VBY, how much should I rotate each one of my tires? All you need is to multiply this matrix where D depends on the uh, dimension of the robot, R depends on the size of the wheels. That will give you U1, U2, and U3. If I ask you for the opposite, I give you U1, U2, and U3, and I ask you what is with this rotation of the three wheels, what is going to be the omegas? The omega BZ, VBX, and VBY, can you find it? You say, yes, I can. And this omega BZ, VBX, and VBY are going to be H0 inverse times the vector U, right? So if you want to do the forward velocity problem, you can do it because this is a 3 by 3 matrix. And you can invert it as long as it's invertible, right? So that's the problem. Can you invert this? We can invert a matrix when it is what? Full rank or the determinant of it is not zero. So let's see if this matrix is full rank or not. And that is the topic that I mentioned here, that if you want to be able to get unique UI values given a specific body twist, VB, you need to choose this xi, yi, beta i, and gamma i for each will such that the matrix H of 0 is full rank. Otherwise, when you go ahead and say that u is equal to H0 inverse times that body twist Vb, you cannot invert this. Now, in this case, this is a 3 by 3. If it's full rank, you should be able to invert it easily, right? Now, in this case, with the arrangement that we chose for the wheels, with the gammas, betas, x, and y, and everything, is my H matrix full rank? So we have to look at this. And you clearly see it is, right? Because no column does depend on the other columns. Clearly, this one is independent from the two others because it has this extra zero and these two here the ratio is one here the ratio is not one right so here it's like one 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 here is like one negative one half negative one half so all three columns are independent so this guy has a full rank or a rank of three here which means it is invertible so i can easily invert this and if i give you again these three components uh, if i give you sorry the three components in U and say so you give me uh, omega B V B X and V B Y you can easily do that and also backwards. So it's really important that this matrix, whatever we choose for it, it is what? It is a full rank matrix, right? Now when you have a robot like this where the number of wheels is more than the three degrees of freedom that you have in the workspace your equations will be like this, that you have three desired velocity components, one rotational, two linear, and you have four U's. Clearly, if you try to solve here, you have four unknowns and three, and um, if you multiply, you have really three equations and four unknowns that you really have. And that's not achievable in general unless, unless there are some constraints between these U's, okay? Or backwards, if I give you U's, you cannot arbitrarily choose U's and achieve whatever you want. So 
let me summarize that. If I give you omega b v b x and v v y and say you give me u1 to u4, in general, that system of equations is under constraint. You have three equations, four unknowns. There is no general solution unless there are some constraints, some relation between these u's. And I'll show you what relations in a minute. On the other hand, if I give you four arbitrary u's and say, hey, could you give me omega bx, omega by, and omega uh, vbx and vb by without any problem? The answer is no. If I just choose the four u's arbitrarily, there will be sliding in the direction of motion. There will be sliding. You cannot achieve everything because your system is now over constrained. You have three equations. You have um, four equations, three unknowns, and guess what? Your system is over constrained. You can achieve it with error, and error here means a slipping of the tires. Okay, so what constraint now do you need, right? As I said, I want to know how much U I need to achieve something. What kind of constraint? Well, if you take a look, I can tell you from the columns of this uh, H of zero matrix. Well, what is that? If you look at, for example, the middle column, all of the coefficients are one. What does that mean? It means if you want to achieve the middle component velocity and nothing else, this one. In other words, your body twist would look like zero, some V and zero. So all you need is for this robot to just move forward. That's all that you need. What kind of constraint do you have between the U's? This middle column would tell me that all of the U's have to be the same number. Okay, so U1 should be the same as U2 should be the same as U3 should be the same as U4. The numbers in this column are the relative weight between the U's, okay? The only way I can move perfectly forward is all of the wheels are rotating at the same RPM. That's the only way you can do it. If you look at the, uh, let's say the third one. The third one, the weight for it comes from the third column. What does that mean? It means if I want to achieve a relation like this, 0, 0, and V. So what does it mean? I don't rotate, I don't go forward, I only go sideways. Just move sideways. Something that you could not achieve in differential drive, just go sideways. What kind of weights do I need? If you see U2 and 4 are positive, U1 and U3 are negative. So it means U1 should be the same as U3, U2 should be the same as U4, and U1 and U2 should be opposite sign of each other, right? And what does that mean? Well, if you look at the arrangement of the wheels here, we started with wheel number one to be the front left, then we went clockwise and we went to wheel two, wheel three, and wheel four. So when it says one and three rotate the same means these two, and two and four means these two. So the ones in red should rotate in one direction. The one in green should rotate in the opposite direction. The opposite wheels should have the same RPM and the other ones should have the opposite RPM. If you do that way, then your robot does go sideways only. Right? And I'll show you right now in a demo in VREP. And finally, what if you want to achieve a... Um, uh, rotation only, which is this one. If you want to achieve a rotation only, so you have just some omega and no V, so just rotate in place, what do you need? If you look at the weights, the weight of the first component and the last component are the same, and then the second one and the third one are the same. So it means U1 and U4 are the same thing, U2 and U3 are the same thing, and then U1 and U2 are again negative of each other. So what does this one mean? It means U1 and 4, which are both on the same side, 
these two should rotate in one direction, these two should rotate the other direction. And that was the same thing that you have with differential drive, right? If you remember in differential drive, you only had two wheels, not four. If you wanted to rotate in place, this one should go, let's say, counterclockwise or clockwise. This other one should go exactly what? Backwards, right? So it should go like this. Remember, if the omegas of the two wheels were uh, equal and opposite of each other, it would only rotate in place. That's the same thing here. But both of the wheels on the left and both of the wheels on the right should go the same direction. That means rotation in place. And if opposite ones are rotating the same, then it goes sideways, right? So let's look at all these different scenarios here in VREP. And again, you clearly see if I want to achieve something specific, I only can choose specific use. I cannot choose use arbitrarily. Some of the use should be equal to each other right which means i need to bring down the number of uh, independent use that i would choose right because here all the use that i'm choosing is simply really one number one number will give me u1 and 3 and the negative of that gives me 2 and 4 so here i only need to choose one u number and then use the negative of that as well the same thing here and here is only one u so here i only have one command that number and negative of it, or just that number alone, to achieve one kind of degree of freedom in the motion. And that's easily achievable. So let's look at VREP. Let's uh, basically uh, take a look at this. This is the software VREP, or some people might call it Capella Sim. It's a very, very good software for robotic simulations. It has all sorts of robots. Once you go under robots, you can have all sorts of mobile robots, as you can see here. Snake robot, humanoid robot, ball robot, hex pod robot, all of the things that I mentioned in one of my previous videos. Right, differential drives, you have the omnidirectional here, and there is another omnidirectional here. Right, line follower, all sorts of things, all sorts of uh, robots, even a quadcopter. Everything is there, and if you go under manipulator arms, then there are also all sorts of manipulator arms, whether open chain or closed chain like this, right? There are all sorts of them here, and it's really, really good. Uh, this uh, steward platform, all sorts of things are here, so this is really amazing for uh, educational. Uh, purposes and I'll try to use this platform more from this point on in addition to MATLAB to demonstrate some stuff for you. So here all I did I went into mobile robots and then dragged this omnidirectional that I want with the mechanic wheels this KUKA uh, U-Bot right just drag it, uh, drag it and bring it here right that's all it is and when you do that here on the scene, simulation scene, you see that robot that is added. It has so many components under it. Later, I'll explain them more. There are joints that you can control their motion, and there are physical blocks that you can change the size of this object, the color of it, and everything, right? For each part in this robot, there is a component here that you can control the size, the orientation, the location, the joints you can control, how they move, and so on and so forth, right? And here, actually, if you want, you can uh, pan the scene, right? So click on the pan, and you can move it up, down, left, right, forward, backward. You can rotate the scene like this. You can zoom in and zoom out like this. You can, if you want, change the way that the camera is viewing the scene. You can do it fit to view, right? You can uh, do a quick selection. You can move an object. You can rotate an object. So these guys are for the scene. These two are for the object, right? So let's say right now, if I want to move this object a little bit relative to the scene, by the way, you can use your mouse too. Your scroll, if you just scroll, it does zoom out and zoom in. If you just hold down left key, you can also do the same thing. If you hold down the mouse and drag, now you can rotate, right? So you have all sorts of things that you can do here, right? And here, 
when the pan is mode you can just hold down the left key and drag that does the pan job for you so uh, let's say here I want to relocate this object so what do I do I click on this one I choose this uh, robot and here I can put it at the specific position or I can translate it align these three axes XYZ as you can see so let's say I want to move it a little bit to the right so it means moving negative X axis so here I say negative one right and I say translate and there we go it's one unit to the uh, left side or right side because x is to the left the way you see it here right now i can move it for example half a unit to uh in the y direction which means forward just make sure you put this back to zero so now it is going to move forward and then i can move it off the plate which is not a good idea because here the gravity is active and it is going to drop on the scene so make sure you set the z at zero and if I want, I can rotate the object as well. So I click here, and now I can orient it, or I can rotate it. Let's say I want to rotate this about the z-axis by 90 degrees, right? And there we go, right? Now here, when you do rotation, it's either the world z-axis or the own frame. If you don't want it to do a big shift of location like that, because z-axis is not right, the world z-axis is not right on the robot. So when you do a z-rotation, it's going to relocate as well. So if you want to really just rotate it in place, make sure you do it with respect to the own frame, right? And now you see here, <laughs> right? You can completely mess it up, right? So make sure you know exactly what you are doing. And uh, you can also do with mouse rotation as well, okay? So here I can choose this own frame. And here, you see, I can... Uh, orient the part and do it as I wish now here it has some default simulation if you do it you see here it is going forward and then it is doing a sideway motion and then it starts rotating right and I can completely have control over them I can completely control them here so let me show you how to control that one just let me rotate it backwards or uh, move it a little bit so here i'm gonna bring it like this by the way you can change the way that you see things if you come here under the view you can see it in all sorts of different views you can see it, for example from the top view that's always a good view to see right so let me show you it's always a good thing to see it from the top because you can see the tire rotations a lot better so all you need is here if you go to this u bot there is a script here which is the code controlling the behavior right and if you double click on that it brings you the code which is written in the native language of vrep and it's very easy to understand really it's just a bunch of set command and get commands and wait commands and so on and some basic functions so if you know matlab or python or c right uh, understanding this code is by no means hard it has a for loop it's for i from zero to four with increment of one do so it's just once you know programming the syntax is not a big deal right and you see the uh, instead of parentheses in MATLAB it is using uh, basically uh, brackets but if you look the main part of this control is this so first it says what it says hey what I want you to do is set movement half zero zero and then go for ten uh, units of motion what is 0 0.50 and 0? So you have to look at this function set movements. And what it takes is forward velocity, left right velocity, and rotational velocity. So when you say 0 0.500 0 means go 0.5 meters per second forward. No side motion, no rotation. Then what? After 10 units of time computation, then don't move forward, only move sideways. And then what? Don't rotate. Then after that, 
do what? No motion at all, whether forward, backward, left and right, just do a rotation of half radians per second, right? So if you want to make that stay longer, say 20 units of rotation, that's all it is. Go back here or you can close it and then you can run the simulation. So look at the direction of the tires. The first part, it is going only forward, backward. So all tires should rotate the same direction as we discussed. Look at that. Right? Clearly, you see all four of them are going in the same direction. Right? Now, it should start going sideways. When it goes sideways, the opposite wheels should rotate the same and the other ones should go back uh, opposite of that. Take a look here. Look at that. You see? This one and this one the same. These two are opposite. Then... Now the ones on one side are rotating the same, the ones on the other side are rotating backwards, so it is doing rotation in place. Right? So by just controlling the script, you can easily control how this guy is moving, and this guy is just going to keep rotating until you stop it. And you can make your simulation faster or slower, so if it's too slow, you can use on this rabbit to make it faster. Right, or you can use on this turtle to make the simulation uh, slower, right? And you can stop it, and if you want, you can click on this and go back to that uh, isometric view or any other type of view, okay? So clearly, you see how this guy worked, right? And as I said, you can bring all sorts of other types of robots and look at their motions as well. While I'm here, it doesn't hurt if I show you the uh, differential drive robot. That might be nice. So here I get rid of this omnidirectional and I bring in this differential drive here. Right? And uh, this one, we'll see, it is going to move in this direction if we move it. Right? Of course, it moves quite fast. And then when it goes to the end, it drops down. Right? <laughs> There is gravity involved here, so uh, you have to be careful. So this is my uh, differential drive robot, and I'll show you when you change the RPM of each tire what's going to happen. But this V-Rep is not only bringing in a robot and moving the joints. It has a lot that you can do. You can add nature components to it. You can add any other types of components. You can add equipment. Okay, you can add furniture. You can add obstacles. You can add sensors, vision sensors, ultrasonic sensors, and so on and so forth. And you can do all sorts of robotic tasks, right? So it's not just to basically do a, a motion simulation. You can do a lot more. And as I said, uh, we try to use this very amazing software, which you can download, by the way, for free. It's called, again, VREP. And I should be able to show it to you. So here, if we go to Google and just say VREP, right, download, it should take you to the official website of Capellia Robotics. And there are several versions of this. The pro one, you have to pay. But the educational one, which is what I use, is free, so you download it and run it. So it's always good to download this guy and play with it and learn how to work with this. As I said, you can bring obstacles, right? Let's say here I go and bring some furniture, like a chair, right? So let's say I'm trying to simulate the lab environment. And then here, maybe I can put that guy in front of this robot and see if there is any collision uh what's gonna happen right if there is any sensor on this one it should react to it and it should do something right so let's see what happens here you see it detects the object now it goes in the other direction and go falls down from the other side so what this one is doing is trying to avoid obstacles, right? Because it has a sensor on it. One sensor we can find out, right? But in general, 
uh, if you expand each item and see the children sometimes it tells you if it doesn't you can double click on the script and uh, it might tell you what kind of sensor you have here right so you see it has the proximity sensor which detects the closeness to the obstacles right and all the motion that it does right now it sets the velocity of the left and the right tire to be the same number and moves the robot with that so it just moves forward now we not here is two now this is what i do i make one of them which is the left tire goes a little bit slower right so instead of two it goes with one what's going to happen you know when one is going faster than the other not only it moves forward backward it also does steer to the left or right right so let's do it so now if i simulate it it's not going to go straight look see it's going to curve and it is ultimately going to go on a circle correct now if i go back and again modify that code so for example uh, make one of them go let's say left one two but the other one set it at zero so now or maybe the other one make it negative v naught correct now it should only rotate in place so look here right and then if you make both of them negative v naught then it should go backwards correct so uh, modifying this code and getting it to do what you want is not a hard thing here you see it's going backwards now so this environment is absolutely good for the sake of simulation i absolutely love this environment and it is uh, purposefully designed for uh, robotic simulations for uh, um, path planning for so many other things right so this is a very good environment here so let's put some stuff behind it let's see what it does there we go right it's not going to move forward it hit something but it has no uh we really messed up the uh algorithm right so we have you when you modify this code you really need to know what you're doing okay so here i put it back to what it was let's do it right now it is doing now it goes that direction now it is coming you see now it gets stuck <laughs> because that curvature kind of matches the bottom of the chair curvature right so it is quite realistic if you put objects on the top of each other they will have collision and as i said this is a very good environment for simulation of robotic systems and we'll try to use it more so hopefully this uh, explanation of omnidirectional how you get the forward or inverse velocity relations and the fact that you cannot just arbitrarily pick x i y i beta i and gamma i otherwise this matrix h of zero is not going to be full rank and you cannot invert it if you have more wills than three in 2d problems then you cannot just choose all use arbitrarily you have to look at the weights that each column will give you to choose a specific types of motion and uh uh, difference between a mechanical will a general omnidirectional will the body twist that we called here this omega b z vbx and vby and so on thank you so much for your attention i will see you in my next lecture